Lord, it's a plane. No, it's an integrated circuit and it's coming right for us. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 511 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Are we talking about ICs this week? Well, yes. Yes, we are. My guest is Brandon Bouts from Cadence Design Systems, and we're talking about the challenges of IC design closure today, how distribution and optimization can help address growing design challenges, and the details of Cadence's Certus Closure Solution. Also this week, I investigate a new soft robot developed by Cornell University that can not only heal itself, but also knows when it needs to heal. First up, let's talk about IC Design Closure with Brandon from Cadence. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning, Amelia. So let's first talk about design closure. Now, what do you see are some of today's biggest challenges with design closure in particular? So in talking with customers, we we know design sizes are growing considerably. Just a few years ago, we were dealing with a few hundred million instances. Now we're dealing with well over a billion instances. So as the design size grow, naturally run times get longer, compute resources increase. So you've got this problem of larger more complicated designs taking more time, and yet product schedules are getting more and more aggressive. And we all know in the various industries out there that you have to meet particular market windows. So chip providers are very keen to reduce their schedule and make sure they have a predictable means of delivering their product. So Brandon, you've added a new product to your sign-off line. What is it called and what exactly does it do? So we're very excited to introduce the Cadence Certus Closure Solution. So in talking with customers, we really wanted to lens in on that sign-off closure problem. So as the designs have gotten bigger and schedules have gotten more aggressive, we knew that this was uh, an area that we wanted to focus our R&D energies on. And in Certus, what we're aiming to provide here is an environment for full chip concurrent optimization and sign-off closure. And you know this collaboration with multiple customers started years ago, and it really builds off a lot of the technologies that we've had in the market now for several years. As you mentioned, we're very excited to announce this product, and uh, we're positioned for multiple customer deployments now, and the product is available now. We'll certainly be hearing more from us. We look forward to interacting with customers with our new Certus Closure Solution product. Excellent. Now, Brandon, how is this new Certus product different from other legacy products and methodologies? Like I said, although we've been able to build from the Tempest STA engine and the Innovus place and route engines legacies, Certus is the first of its kind to offer an environment merging both sign-off analysis, optimization, along with full physical implementation. We knew that from a productivity perspective, this environment would be key to the solution. Also, to help address those growing design challenges, we knew distribution, that is the ability to launch multiple jobs on multiple machines, in particular for optimization, would be critical to the solution. So this newly distributed algorithm is very differentiating for our product line, and we think really helps to provide the benefit of faster turnaround times to our customers. Other areas where this is different is that we're really merging, again, that physical implementation. We've been able to leverage, as I mentioned, capabilities from the Innovus Place and Route Engine, of course, the detailed placer, but also the router, so that we can deliver a fully finished product at the end of the CERTUS cycle. So we're not talking just ECOs here, but we have a fully finished analyzed uh, chip at the end of the CERTUS run. And this greatly helps productivity. So other than productivity, what are the key benefits for designers using Certus? So productivity is first and foremost, but many tools also proclaim power, performance, and area benefit. Okay, this is known as PPA in the industry. 
And CERTIS certainly delivers on the PPA benefits and builds off of the Tempest ECO PPA legacy. But there's much more to be had at the full chip level. Keep in mind, Cadence has a very strong solution for block level PPA closure from Genis to Enovis through Tempest ECO with Cerebrus around. But with Certus, what we're trying to do is gain extra power performance and area benefit at the full chip. And in talking to customers, one of the most key areas that PPA is not commonly gained here, we call this untapped power, is at the interface level. And so I mentioned the distributed algorithms. So given the distribution function of of Certus, we have the capacity within the tool to optimize power and save power at the interface. And this is really differentiated in the industry. And I think this is going to really help customers meet their power targets. Now, let me move to an additional benefit, which is related to automation and productivity. We wanted to provide a design environment. As such, we wanted to provide full automation of the flow. And in talking to customers, typical sign-off activities require teams of engineers to perform the closure. This involves folks running the optimization, and then, of course, uh, going back and implementing each of the changes within the blocks. So with Certus, what we wanted to provide was a fully automated environment so that each of the block iterations and each of the block implementation changes are done automatically. That's a key benefit for users. It really puts the power of closure in the hands of fewer engineers that can drive the process start to finish without having to rely on or be burdened by uh, different time zones and engineers elsewhere distributed around the world. So Brandon, you talked about this a little bit, but tell me more about how Certus fits into the Cadence full flow design philosophy. Yeah. So We've really been promoting the full flow philosophy, and that is a reuse of the analysis and implementation engines from the beginning of the process through the block closure. And with Certus, what we've done is, again, truly integrated the STA engine from Tempest, the Innovus place and route engines, along with extraction techniques from Qantas and physical verification techniques from Pegasus. And so building on that full flow philosophy, Certus provides that single environment for users to drive the entire closure process at the full chip level. I should add that integration itself is key here, but it's more how we've integrated it. The fact that this integration is literally at the code level makes the results that much better because there's fewer potential moving parts. And it allows a predictable closure methodology because one step can look at and and understand what the next step in the flow is going to do. So that way we can provide faster closure and really build off that full flow design philosophy through tight integration and reuse of our core engines. Excellent. So Brandon, if my audience is interested in learning more, where should they go? Please go on to the Cadence website, cadence.com forward slash go, forward slash Certus, C-E-R-T-U-S, cadence.com slash go slash Certus. Perfect. All right, Brandon, it is time for your off the cuff question. Now, a little birdie told me that you had a awesome summer. So tell me more about that. Yeah, well, you know, with COVID, uh, travel's been difficult. So uh, we were definitely looking forward to getting out there and, uh, you know, experiencing what the world had to offer. So we were fortunate enough to plan a trip to Spain. And this was one of the first trips, really the first trip for my uh, teenage boys. Now, I don't speak any Spanish. My wife doesn't speak any Spanish. So we were relying on 15 and 17-year-old boys' ability to speak Spanish to help get us around. We did wind up in a few uh, wrong train stations now and then. Overall, the boys did a good job getting us around, and I I highly recommend Spain. We had a great time, great balance of culture and uh, food and uh, really great cities. was a bit warm this summer, but uh, we came prepared. So I I definitely recommend Spain. It was great to finally have a vacation overseas. Now that COVID's gone or lessened, it's exciting just to get back out there not just for personal reasons, but for work as well and meet customers and and begin traveling again and uh, have face-to-face interaction. 
I love it, Brandon. That sounds super awesome. My 13-year-old is taking Spanish now. So maybe if I tell him if he sticks with it, uh, we can go to Spain in a couple of years. (laughs) There you go. That was definitely the thought process. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Brandon. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Likewise, Amelia. So what if our robots could heal themselves? Sounds great, right? But what if they knew that they needed to heal themselves? Then that would be something, right? Well, that's exactly what a team of researchers at Cornell University have done. Led by Associate Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Rob Shepard, this team has created a soft robot that can detect when and where it has been damaged and then heal itself all with the help of some optical sensors with a composite material. There's a lot to unravel here. So first, how did these soft robots know that they need to fix themselves? Well, this team was able to accomplish this with the development of a new technique that uses fiber optic sensors that have been coupled with LED lights that are capable of detecting even the slightest change of the surface of the robot. Very importantly, these sensors were enhanced with an elastomer that includes hydrogen bonds to encourage quick healing and disulfide exchanges for strength. All of this combined is called SHIELDS, or Self-Healing Light Guides for Dynamic Sensing. And it gives these soft robots the ability to self-heal from cuts at room temperature without any intervention from outside sources. So how did they test this new SHIELDS technology? Well, first they installed SHIELDS in a soft robot that looks like a four-legged starfish, kind of. And then they equipped that robot with feedback control as well. And get this, when they punctured one of those robotic legs six times, after each cut, it was able to detect the damage and self-heal in about a minute. And it even modified its gait based on the damage to that leg as well. So, are these soft robots indestructible? Absolutely not. This team points out that just like the human body, chemical changes to the skin or the outside of the robot, like acid or burns, will do damage. But cuts? No problem. Where is this technology headed in the future? Well, Shepard and his team plan on creating a very enduring robot that has a self-healing skin, but uses the same skin to feel its environment to be able to do more tasks. And they plan on doing this with the addition of an integration of machine learning algorithms capable of recognizing tactile events into the Shields platform. Wow. Okay, so if you want even more information about this study or to check out the associated research paper called Autonomous Self-Healing Optical Sensors for Damage Intelligent Soft-Bodied Systems, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this episode as well. And if you want even more fish fry about robotics, I would strongly encourage you to check out my new playlist on YouTube called Robotics on Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. This series is chock full of all kinds of robotic goodness, including my recent interview with Phil Hutchinson from Element 14 about their new Twist, Turn, and Move Robotics Design Challenge. I also investigate self-replicating living robots, Joyce, the first humanoid robot with intelligent vision, and tiny aquatic robots inspired by sea creatures. And you can check out this playlist by clicking the link below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, or you can just head on over to youtube.com slash eejournal and scroll down a bit, and there it'll be. 
Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can also monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I just mentioned. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and a selection of fish fry podcasts as well. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel too. I'm just saying. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's fish frying page. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of December 16th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton. You've been fried.